Good evening, everyone. I'm going to remind you to please silence your phones tonight. My name is Cristina Chisarreta, Manager of Adult Programs here at the Dallas Museum of Art, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to tonight's Bichelle Family Lecture Series on Archaeology, Making Mississippian Meanings. We would like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Ned Bichelle and the Bichelle Family Foundation for underwriting this lecture series. To introduce our speaker tonight, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Michelle Rich, the Ellen and Harry S. Parker III Assistant Curator of the Arts of the Americas. Dr. Rich is currently writing and editing a publication showcasing more than 100 masterpieces of indigenous art from the DMA's Ancient Americas Collection, planning a refresh of the Arts of the Americas galleries and our venue curator for the Spirit Large Mississippian Art from Spiro. Her background as an archaeologist situates her well to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Alex W. Barker. Please welcome her to the stage. Thank you, Christina. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here. I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce to you Dr. Alex W. Barker. He is the director of the Arkansas Archaeological Survey, and he has previously served as director of the Museum of Art and Archaeology at the University of Missouri, the curator of North American Archaeology and vice president for collections, research, and exhibitions at the Milwaukee Public Museum. And many years ago, when I first met Alex, he was the curator of archaeology at the Dallas Museum of Natural History, which is now the Perot Museum. He's past president of the American Anthropological Association, a fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute, and a graduate of the Getty Museum Leadership Initiative Institute. He was an Obama-era appointee to the Federal Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act Review Committee, and is a peer elected expert member of two International Council of Monuments and Sites International Scientific Committees, the International Scientific Committee for Archaeology and Heritage Management, and the International Scientific Committee for Earth and Architectural Heritage. He is a pretty impressive man. <laughs> In 2002, he led a team of researchers that demonstrated that a scraper from the Spiro site, now at the Smithsonian, had been made from obsidian from the Sierra de Pachuca source outside of Mexico City. It's a very distinctive green obsidian, and this was the first uh, direct evidence for Mesoamerican material from Mississippian contexts after more than two, two centuries of speculation about contact between those two regions of the world. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Barker for his talk, Making Mississippian Meanings. Thank you, Michelle, and I do want to take a moment to thank both Michelle and Christina for the wonderful arrangements for my visit, and also thank Mr. and Mrs. Beauchelle and the Beauchelle family for making this lecture series possible. Tonight, what I'd like to do is talk to you about how art means. We spend a lot of time worrying about what it means, but the question of how we get at how it means is in some ways much more interesting and in many ways more intractable. So if we take a familiar piece of art, we can get at its meaning by looking at its context, by looking at other works like it. And after a while, it becomes almost second nature. So here, for example, we have Raphael's Madonna del Cardellino. It's a very famous work. It shows the Madonna seated on a chair. It's the throne of wisdom. And we know that, among other things, because she's holding a book saying the throne of wisdom. She's seated in a way to represent the church. She's wearing her characteristic red, symbolizing the passion of Christ, and blue, symbolizing the church. The overall composition is the classic high pyramid you get from the early Cinquecento. You have John the Baptist, who's recognizable by the way he's dressed and the fact he's got a small dipper so he can ladle water over the, bap the baptized and Jesus reaching for the goldfinch. A European goldfinch is recognized because it's got a red flash on its head, and there's a story that says that the flash is from the goldfinch flying down to Christ when he's on the cross and trying to pick at one of the thorns on the crown of thorns. 
and he's splashed with Christ's blood. So all of these become iconographical symbols that help us understand the meaning of this painting, which shows Jesus and John the Baptist surrounded by and supported by the church. It has a whole series of meanings that make sense if you know the rest of the story. Now, the question is, what would you do if you'd lost many of those narratives? To be clear, the rest of the material I'll be talking about tonight was made by ancestral Native Americans, and those ancestral Native Americans had their own set of stories. I am not questioning whether their descendants know those stories. I have no question at all about it, and we have ample evidence that people can communicate an enormous amount of information through oral history over hundreds of years. So let's just postulate that those descendant groups have maintained the equivalent of every word of the Bible unchanged. The challenge is there's not a single bit of the iconography of this painting that comes from the Bible. It all comes from a series of secondary, ephemeral, and esoteric sources that wouldn't make sense in, in terms of the original source material. Let's make it harder still, and I chose this painting for a reason. This is painted in about 1506, and Vasari tells us that Raphael painted it as a wedding present for his friend Lorenzo Nasi. Sometime in the 1540s, it's damaged in an earthquake. It's broken into 17 different pieces. This is an oil on panel, so the wood is, is very sensitive and easy to break. Now suppose that we don't have all of those 17 pieces. We only have a subset of them. We can't necessarily even match them up. And all of the other comparanda we might have used from the, the Renaissance are in the same condition. So we don't have all the narratives of the iconographic tradition, and we don't all have all the objects. They're partial or incomplete. Now how do you get at the meaning of this painting? And to give you an idea of why this is important, I want to take a very quick digression to talk about what Native American society looked like a thousand years ago, before European contact. On the left is a depiction from when the French first entered the Mississippi Valley, and they encountered a group called the Natchez. The French were amazed at the pomp and grandeur that the king of the Natchez, the great son, and how he was venerated by his people and how they honored him and how they did things that they thought were remarkable in, term, uh, in terms of the admiration and the, the, the stature in which they held their king. Please remember, we're talking about Frenchmen whose frame of reference for an adult king was Louis XIV of France, the most powerful absolutist ru ruler in modern European history. And they were impressed by the great son of the Natchez. They were also present when the brother of the great son, a gentleman named Tattooed Serpent, passed away, and they described his funeral ritual. This is a diagram of part of that ritual. The dotted line in a spiral represents the litter bearers who are carrying the body of Tattooed Serpent. They walk about 10 steps, and then they go in a circle. Then they walk about 10 steps, and they go in another circle. As they're going through those circles, they're trampling on the bodies of infants who have been thrown in front of the litter bearers by the, the infant's parents as a sacrifice to honor the passing of Tattooed Serpent. At different ceremonies, the French noted as many as a dozen such infants being contributed. Then the litter passes by a series of individuals who are being sacrificed by being strangled on the, while the, the litter is on the way to the temple. These are not captives. These are high-ranking people within the Natchez society who are being sacrificed as part of the funeral rite. So it is a very impressive ceremony. And as it happens, we found the archaeological remnants of exactly that ceremony. This is the site where those things happened. It's the Fatherland site, also known as the Grand Village of the Natchez in western Mississippi. And archaeological work was able to document all of the things being described in the French accounts. As you'll see, the mounds are not terribly big. They come about a fifth of the way up a normally sized grown tree. But this is not what the site would have looked like. This is not what a Natchez site would have looked like 100 years before or 200 years before. Before a series of dearth and disease and desolation and death had more than decimated Native American society. You all know the term decimated. It comes from classical sources. It means one in 10 killed. For Native American societies, it was at least nine out of 10. So 
roughly three times as great as the Black Death, at minimum, and probably more than that. This is what a Natchez site would have looked like before European contact. This is Emerald Mound. You might look at it and think, well, that's not really all that different or that impressive, but if you turn around, this is what would be behind you. The line you see, the vertical line, is a modern staircase made of railroad ties with a handrail going up the middle. But this isn't the mound either. If you get up in the air, you'll see that both of those are small eminences at either end of a much larger and much more massive mound. And this is what a Natchez mound would have looked like before European contact. Everything else is a result of that period of dislocation and destruction, which stripped Native society of, of much of, of the complexity with which we, we see a site like Spyro today. The exhibition that's currently in the galleries shows what sites would have looked like 500 years before European contact. And it's a remarkably sophisticated and nuanced artistic tradition, including repoussé copper, stone and fire clay, pottery, organics. We forget that most archaeological sites in North America do not have the preservation of organics, and so we've lost a huge proportion of the artwork which would have graced sites in prehistory. And engraved shell. Tonight, I'm going to focus primarily on one medium, engraved shell. A couple of reasons for this. One is I think it, it allows us to look at designs in a very simple form. Second, I'm a little concerned that if we start switching back and forth between different mediums, some of the technical issues associated with creating art get in the way of understanding the iconography. So not completely, but primarily engraved shell art. And to the degree I can, I'll focus primarily on gorgets. Gorgets are primarily circular engraved shell objects that are worn on the chest. This is an early 1500s print of Tamakwa, and each one of the figures in the front is wearing at least one gorget. The one in the center is wearing two. I'm choosing gorgets for a really simple reason. They have two suspension holes, so we know which way is up. For a lot of the designs, we have no idea. And as you walk through the exhibition, I hope you look very carefully at the engraved shell cups. There is no way there is a single orientation for those cups. Some of the designs, you have to hold the spire up, some you have to hold it down, some you have to hold it sideways, and some you have to turn the cup. And if you imagine the cup is containing a liquid, you can imagine what that means. So what I'd like to do is start with a single motif, a single motif where we think we know what it means. And that motif is the cross and circle. If you talk to Native, South Ameri Native Southeastern groups today, they will un unanimously say that the cross and circle represents sacred fire. That doesn't prove it was the case in prehistory, but in the 1930s and 1940s, when the South Southeastern ceremonial complex was first defined, this was the only motif that was defined in terms of its meaning instead of its form. So cross and circle has always been assumed to represent sacred fire. And it shows up regularly in certain places. One of them is these spider gorgets. This is what's called a macadam style gorget from the American mid-continent. This is its standard form, its canonical form. You have a spider, usually head down. There are a series of framing lines around the outside and it's got the head, the, the, the thorax, and a central body panel. I don't know how many of you know much about natural history, but there is no spider ever made that has those body parts. Spiders are arachnids, they're not insects. They have two body parts, a cephalothorax and an abdomen. This is not a normal spider. Here's a line drawing making that a little clearer. And again, the suspension holes let us orient the design, so we know the spider is head down. Michelle mentioned that I used to be at the Dallas Museum of Natural History, and I spent some time as chief curator and interim director, which allowed me to say one day that any family that comes in with kids under the age of 12, if they draw a spider, they get in for free. 
And so I got almost 100 drawings of spiders by kids under the age of 12. And despite all of our complaints about kids not knowing science, they got spiders right. Two body parts, eight legs, usually head up. And Mississippian artists always draw the spider wrong. Why? Now, I'm not willing to accept the argument that it's because they didn't know what spiders look like. In many cases, they're done with such care and nuance that we can identify the genus of the spider being depicted. This, for example, we know has to be an orb weaver because that zigzag you see coming out of the head of the spider is a stabilimenta on a web, and only the Argiope orb weavers have that. So it can't be because they didn't know what spiders looked like. It has to be because that central body part, that anomaly, is supposed to be telling us something. It's important. It's an iconosemic element. It's stepping out from the design to tell us this has symbolic meaning and importance. And there are other things that should suggest that to us. Some of the Mississippian spiders are unusual in other respects. Here, for example, is a line drawing from an engraved shell cup from Spyro and it shows a spider with a very large central element. And those wrappings you see around the joints of the legs, we know from other depictions, are supposed to represent raccoon skins. So this is a biggish spider. Some of them are more than big, they're supernatural. Here we see a winged spider. And if you remember the repousse copper plate I showed you before, the wing treatment is the same. It's these scallops on the primary covered feathers of the wings that are very distinctive and they show up on the hawk dancer plates that are featured in the exhibition. We'll come back to them in a little bit. So we consistently have this depiction of a spider with an anomalous central body part that contains a cross and circle and a belief that cross and circle represents sacred fire. Again, if you survey southeastern groups, there are certain myths that are very widely shared, and one of them has to do with how sacred fire comes to earth. The Cherokee version goes something like this. All the big fierce animals try to get sacred fire and they all fail. And finally, modest little spider volunteers to go and try and everybody laughs at her. But finally they agree, and so she takes four of her legs and plants them in the earth, and four of the legs she plants in the vault of heaven and keeps it from spinning. Then she scuttles up, gets sacred fire, makes a small basket of silk on her back, and carries sacred fire back to earth. All of the spider gorgets do not show the, the spider head down. There are a few that show the spider head up. And guess what? When the spider is shown head up, there is no cross and circle on its back. Instead, there's either a blank circle or a pitted circle with a series of circles inside it. So it's empty. So as a working hypothesis, as a place to start, let's take that one motif and say, okay, there's decent evidence that suggests this really does represent sacred fire. We can't prove it, but we can use what's called abductive reasoning, an approach proposed by Charles Sanders Peirce that says that instead of going inductively, seeing one example and assuming they're all like that, or deductively, where you propose a covering law and assume everything fits. You take an inference, you say, if that's the case, what are the logical entailments of that inference? What should we see if that's true? And what more can we learn by moving forward with that inference? With me so far? Okay, let's try another example. This was one of the first gorget styles recognized by European Americans. It's called the woodpecker style gorget by archeologists in the 1880s, especially William Henry Holmes. And it has this characteristic form. There are four crested birds in a rotational symmetry around the outside. Then there's an endless loop or a looped square, and then a cross and circle in the center. I'm going to suggest that the cross and circle in the center represents sacred fire. If that's the case, what do the other elements mean? Well, the first thing we have to do, just going back to the work of Erwin Panofsky, is say, what does the referent mean? What is the motif supposed to signify? Not its symbolic meaning, just what is it? 
What are the crested birds? Are they really woodpeckers? I'm going to tell you that I think they are, and I'm going to tell you they're a specific woodpecker, an ivory bill. Since this is an art museum, I'm showing you two paintings of ivory bills. The one on the left is the first European depiction of a living ivory billed woodpecker. It's by Mark Catesby from the 1720s. And on the right is a rather sad painting. It's the last known depiction of a living ivory billed woodpecker painted in 1943 by Don Eckleberry, a 23-year-old artist who was sent into the Singer Tract in Louisiana to try to find the last known nesting pair. I have some reasons for thinking these are ivory bills. First, ivory bills have certain characteristics. We'll see more about them in a moment. One of them is they have a very large and prominent white eye. In many of the depictions in Mississippian art, the eye is so prominent that it's not just shown as large, it actually forms part of the outline of the head, as it does here. Also, there tends to be a single white line coming down from the eye of an ivory-billed woodpecker, or sometimes coming from right below the eye, diagonally across. This is something that other large-crested birds don't have. And finally, it has a very large and very robust beak. It also has some other interesting characteristics. From its earliest descriptions, there's an argument that when the, the woodpecker is angry or agitated, it raises its crest. So the erect crest is an angry bird or a bird that's in a fight, a bird that's agitated. And when the crest is down, the bird is calm. The picture on the right is also from the Singer track, and it shows an immature ivory bill. And I think the fact that it's on that gentleman's head is one of the reasons it's agitated. There can be some variation in the form of these gorgets. On the left is a fenestrated example. On the right is an unfenestrated example. And as you can see, the woodpecker can be shown in different ways. But the elements of the design are the same regardless. This is important because it, as it happens, those differences aren't random, and they don't seem to be temporal. They seem to be spatial. So there are two different contemporary forms of gorget. The fenestrated gorgets are found in the Cumberland Basin, and the unfenestrated gorgets are found in the Tennessee Basin. And that distinction seems to be important. In some cases, the fenestration is very simple. In this example, you can see the, the suspension holes at the top, and basically the fenestrations are nothing more than four more, more suspension holes added in the proper location. But my favorite example is this one. Oops, I'm sorry. This is, got ahead of myself. Here we see an example with fully fenestrated cross and circle. Fenestrations are just windows. And so the, the cross is marked off by the fact that, that between the arms of the cross, the shell has been completely excised and removed. The majority of southeastern gorgets are decorated in the concave face. So if you look at me in profile, they're shaped like this. Cox mound and related forms tend to be on the convex face, which means that when they're sitting against your chest, those fenestrated areas show up as a deep black. They're in shadow. But this is my favorite example. This is an unfenestrated Cox mound gorget that ended up in the Cumberland Basin, and so somebody had to fenestrate it. And it's too small to do that within the arms of the cross, so they just added them where they could. And it does suggest that there's some social significance to whether or not it is fenestrated. It's not just a Morellian trait where that's the way you were taught to do it, and so that's the way it happens. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that all crested birds are, are ivory-billed woodpeckers, by no means. Here, for example, are a series of bone effigy pins from the late woodland period from what's called Jersey Bluff phase in southern Illinois, that are almost certainly not ivory-billed woodpeckers. In fact, I don't think they're woodpeckers, I think they're kingfishers. And there's an elaborate backstory to that that I'm not going to go into right now. And some are depicting the pileated woodpecker, which is a much more common and widely distributed woodpecker, but which has very different habits. And if we have some time at the end, I'll be happy to talk about some of the more important distinctions. This is a key 
A few years ago, people thought ivory bills were still present in the woods of eastern Arkansas, and so various federal officials made keys so you could tell the difference between a pileated and an ivory bill. This actually minimizes the size difference. Ivory bills are considerably larger than a pileated woodpecker, but you'll notice certain specific features, a much larger bill, a much larger white bill, a bright white eye, which is very distinctive, a larger crest, and the male and female have different color crests. Please also notice that while pileated woodpeckers have a black back, ivory bill woodpeckers have this triangular or shield shape, and sometimes when the wings are pulled back, they can become a single one. This is an example of a pileated woodpecker in ancient American iconography. This is from Marco Island. It was found in the 1890s by Frank Cushing from the Smithsonian Institution at a site that also had very good organic preservation. But it's clearly not an ivory bill. I said I was going to try to stick to engraved shell, but not completely. This is one reason why. Engraved shell has simple lines. And in many cases, people have filled in the lines with black substance, but it's not clear if that's what they looked like in antiquity. But in some cases, we can tell what's supposed to be black and what's supposed to be white by the media itself. This is an engraved ceramic bottle from Moundville, and it's a black surface bottle, shell tempered. And so as people engrave through the black surface, the white shell tempering shows through. And as you can see, this I'll show you some line drawings in a moment, but here you see the head of the woodpecker. That's its beak, heavily cross-hatched to emphasize the fact that it's white. There is its eye cross-hatched. There is the white line. And here you see the triangle on the bird's back. I know you have to take that one on faith. There, so here's another one. White eye, white beak, white line, white line. A line drawing showing the same, and another. And the point is that Mississippian artists are perfectly well aware that there are multiple large crested birds, and they want to make sure you know what's being depicted. They're trying to hit you over the head with the idea, this is an ivory bill. This is a bird that has a very specific function. Here I compare a 19th century print of an ivory bill that shows this triangular line on the back and here, and again, the white line and the white bill. My suggestion is that ivory bills represent, in essence, let's say warriors if nothing else, the ability to distinguish between friend and foe, between amity and enmity. Part of this is because we have a large number of woodpecker-headed axes from antiquity. Here you see a whole bundle of them. These are from the Spiro site. In Western art, we generally tend to think in terms of functional metaphors. So when I say woodpecker-headed axe, you probably imagine an axe that's like a woodpecker hitting a tree with its beak. That's not the way Mississippian iconography works. Instead, it's a color metaphor. So the ax bit, which is copper, red copper, on a red cedar pole, represents a continuation of the crest. So this is an erect red crest. And the bit is not the beak of the woodpecker hitting the tree, but the crest, the thing that signifies whether it's angry or not. And it's not a single example. It's not as though the bit may be misplaced in a single example. It's consistently done this way. And it's very clear that's what's intended. I also mentioned that ivory bills have a very distinctive eye. They have a, a bright white sclera to the eye. In case there's any question, the depictions consistently show this form of axe. Here, for example, this is an engraved shell cup. This is a Craig B cup from Spyro. And if you look at the bottom, you can see this woodpecker-headed axe stuck through the belt of the winged figure. 
And again, there's no question where the bit is because this is a, a spatula bit, so we can see it's reversed. And, and this is very distinctive, but when you look at the entire corpus of Mississippi and art, these forms become increasingly geometric and stylized. So by the time you go from Craig B to Craig C, which is believed to be a later phase, you see a whole series of figures in the forked pole, forked pole co corpus that show these woodpecker headed axes that go from relatively recognizable to not really a clue. But they still have certain things that are distinctive, like that bright white eye. Well, how do you show that on an ax? Simple. You put some engraved shell and lay it where the eye is supposed to be. So you can't say maybe that's a pileated woodpecker. No, it's got a very bright white eye. This is, is an example that's actually in the exhibition. Remember that you have a heavily corroded copper bit. Imagine this as clean copper. So not green, not the copper sulfate you get as an after effect of years of erosion and acid, but the bright red native copper. Now, why do I think this represents a warrior? There are a couple of reasons. One is ivory bills don't act like other birds. This was marked from the very beginning. In fact, one of my favorite stories about ivory bills is in the early 1800s, Alexander Wilson captured one. He actually wounded it. It died within three days. And he put it in his hotel room while he went to get food for his horse. And when he came back, most of the window was gone, and the ivory bill was halfway out the window. So he grabbed it, and I, depending, I don't remember if he tied it or chained it to a mahogany desk and went out to dinner. And when he came back, he had a two-legged desk, and the ivory bill was again trying to leave. This is an ivory bill that's wounded and on its way to death. So these are very active and aggressive birds. Watch this, this video and watch how quickly and decisively it moves. We also know that this is an important element, that this association between warriors and woodpeckers, between amity and enmity, and the ability to raise and lower its crest. Here we see an example. This is Audubon, a raised crest female and a normal male. There are a whole series of pipes from the historic period, ethnohistoric pipes from different Native American groups, where they're trying to create a context in which you can make a statement that says, we're friends. This is, this is a moment in which there will be no aggression. Here, for example, is an Iowa pipe stem from the Milwaukee Public Museum. And we not only have the pipe, we have the testimony from the people who made the pipe, who explained why it's made the way it is. And it's got an ivory bill scalp here. The beak is pulled back, and the crest is tied down. And that's why they added the crest, because by tying down the crest, you can prevent the crest from being raised, which means you can't have aggression. One ivory bill, and then they made a series of other symbolic ones out of beads. Now, as a one-off, that might not be completely convincing, so here's another example. And interestingly, remember how I said ivory bills have black crests if they're female and red crests if they're male? Pileated, both male and female, have red crests. And so there's a tendency in these pipes to choose female ivory bill heads. Because if you use the black crest, that's the only bird it can be. You can't confuse it. So again, they're hitting you over the head and telling you, pay attention. That's what this is. And some of these pipe stems have as many as seven ivory bill scallops associated with them. Remember, this is a very rare bird even in antiquity. And so the idea that a given group in this case, the Iowa, who are not within the original range of, a of an ivory-billed woodpecker, can have seven of these scalps associated with a single pipe stem. It's pretty impressive. When, when Mark Catesby described, remember the painting Mark Catesby did of the ivory-billed woodpecker, the first depiction by a European in 1720s? He described these as birds that are traded all the way up into Canada because of their symbolic importance. <laughs> 
We also believe they're associated with warfare because we have depictions showing that's the way they're used. This is a thrust and tablet from Tennessee. It was recovered in the late part of the 19th century. The exact dates are debated. And if you look to the left, you see a figure holding a woodpecker-headed ax and brandishing it. Make it a little bit easier. Here's a line drawing. And the figure is also wearing a gorget. As is I was warned that it's hard to see this pointer on a light background. There's another gorget. And finally, media. Almost all of these gorgets are made of engraved shell. There are a couple of exceptions. I'll show you one of the two exceptions, and I'll intentionally not show you the other. This is um, shale or some shale-like material. It comes from a cave site. And the other set is on human bone, human parietal skull bone. So my suggestion would be that these crested woodpeckers, these ivory-billed woodpeckers that are found around the outside of this gorget form represent some variety of either warrior or an indication of amity and enmity. So at this point, my argument would be we have a gorget that has sacred fire in the center and a series of warriors, in the, let's say in the cardinal directions. I realize they're not cardinal because it's vertical, but humor me. So what does the loop square mean? What does it represent? Well, once we've gotten that far, it's not that hard. In Muskogean ceremonialism, in the summer, there's something called the square ground. And it's the ceremonial context in which all the big ceremonies take place. It's a formal dance ground, and that's the way it's laid out. And it's laid out with sacred fire, described as sacred fire, in the center, in the form of a, a cross or a cross in circle. And then surrounding it, those lines you see are the arbors, where the different clans come in and they have specific places they need to be for those ceremonies. And this is the standard form. This is from a Bureau of American Ethnology description of a Creek village. It's got nothing to do with iconography. And yet they're consistently shown this way. Here's another example. Again, sacred fire in the center. And by the way, when, when native groups describe this sacred fire, there will be a fire in the center of the dance ground, but they describe there being four logs you can't see in the cardinal directions, and those are brought together to actually form the sacred fire. So the sacred fire is understood as a distinct thing from the fire you see in the middle of the dance ground. I have more examples. So plausibly, we could see this as a gorget that represents the main ceremonial summer ground of Muskogeans or Muskogean related groups as a plausible argument. If that's the case, what are the logical entailments? What else what might we see? Well, you remember the Tamukwa I showed you where there was a gentleman with two gorgets? Coxmound gorgets, when they're found with other gorgets, are typically found with a form called a Triskel gorget. And this is what they look like. The characteristic design is a three-legged or three-armed swirl in the middle, the triskel, with a series of round circles, I'm sorry, round elements. Round circles is a bit redundant. Round elements, usually two lines of them, although sometimes the outer line are more, more ovoid. They're found in the same general region as Coxmound gorgets. Curiously, there are two different kinds. There are fenestrated and unfenestrated forms. There aren't as many of these, so I can't tell you statistically that the fenestrated gorgets of this form are found only in the Cumberland and the unfenestrated are found only in, in the Tennessee, but it tends to work that way. And here's what they look like. Three-armed spiral, by the way, the spiral is always sinistral, which means going to the left. And one or, I'm sorry, two or more lines of these circular ovoid elements around the triskel. Now the square ground is where ceremonies happen in the summer. What happens in the winter? 
Well, they moved from the square ground to something called the Chakofa, or the roundhouse. And on the left is a map of a creek roundhouse. In the center is sacred fire, which is not formed by a cross of logs, but instead formed by a spiral of wood or wood shavings that burn more slowly. And it's inside a structure which is unusual in having a large stepped roof, which is, is supported by a series of six to eight very large vertical logs, and then another series outside that that support the steps of the roof. So my suggestion would be that just as Cox Mound Gorgets represent the summer ceremonial grounds of a Muscogean group, the Triskel Gorget represents the winter Chakofa and does so in exactly the same way using the same correspondence of elements. And by the way, these don't have the same warrior figures on the outside because it's not an outdoor event where it could easily be profaned by somebody wandering in. It's inside a structure. Those kinds of ceremonial structures are unique to Muscogean groups, and yet the southeastern ceremonial complex, this horizon style that takes off sometime around 1000 AD and continues until about 1500 AD, spans a much larger area. There are groups from the Carolinas to East Texas and from Florida to Wisconsin who are partaking in this same set of designs and motifs. But if this is associated with Muscogean groups, what happens when you get outside of the Muscogean area? You're still in the Southeastern ceremonial complex, but if you're not in, a, in an environment that uses that same structure of ceremonialism, what do you do with those motifs? Well, the answer is you put them together in a different way. Here we see an example from Spyro, which is far outside what we believe to be a Muscogean territory, even in antiquity, and it has all the same elements as a Cox Mound gorget. In this case, the cross and circle, which is fenestrated, is put into rotational symmetry, so it becomes a tetraskelion. They don't do that in the Muscogean area. You have four crested bird heads, again in rotational symmetry, and in fact, the bird heads, which are treated somewhat differently, make the square. And by the way, this, this is the only image I have of this particular gorget in this particular condition. Please note that the suspension holes are here. So it's not, it's only cockeyed in the picture. If you rotate it the right way, it again becomes the square. And so you have the four heads in rotational symmetry, you have the, the cross in circle, but in this case made into a, a, a tetraskelion or a swastika in the center. And you have the square element formed by the heads themselves. So when you get outside of what are probably ancestral Muscogean sites, you have the same elements, but they're put together differently because there's no natural referent that it has to refer to. And we see this in other gorget styles of the same form. On the left is what's called a picket style gorget. They're from Western Mississippi. On the right, the same basic approach. A swastika or a tetraskelion more properly in the center. Four crested wood, four crested bird heads in a rotational symmetry, and the, the square form is actually formed by the beaks instead of by a looped square. Here you have the cross in circle, you have four woodpecker heads, and they're drawn in exactly the same way as you would for a Cox Mound gorget, but they're not in a rotational symmetry, they're in bilateral symmetry facing either side of that central pole. And instead of a square, you have a cross. I'm arguing all of this because the exhibition is marvelous. But in order to make it marvelous, it has to tell one story, and a very simple story. And the reality is probably much more complex, with different elements having different meanings depending on exactly where you are in the universe. And you have to look very carefully at these individual objects and not assume that two objects that look vaguely similar have exactly the same meaning. Here's why. These are two of those wonderful repousse copper, what are called hawk dancer plates. And it's very easy to say that 
Hawk dancer means X. I'd like to suggest to you that whatever else they mean, they don't mean X. They can't mean X. Here's why. Both of these were found at the same mound in northern Georgia, the Edo Mound site. The one on the right was found in the 1870s by an archaeologist named Rogan. He found two plates that seemed to show exactly the same figure. And we can recognize this figure from a number of elements. And by the way, this same figure shows up on other coppers and other materials. Both of these figures do. He has this head plate. It's a very distinctive head plate. And it is consistently shown. It shows up on all kinds of forms. He also has a forked mouth surround and a very distinctive, very large beaded necklace with a, a columella from one of these large conch shells around his neck. And it's usually shown swinging. On a completely different topic, I should note that when you see line drawings of these, they always talk about these male hawk dancers and how these male hawk dancers are symbols of virility. The challenge becomes that they're also shown with breasts, and in two cases, they appear to be pregnant. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions. I'm not suggesting necessarily they're female. I'm suggesting those categories probably don't apply. He also has this very distinctive element, and this is shown in human figural depictions throughout the Mississippian world. It's widely believed to represent a scalp lock. So he's got a scalp at his belt, and it has this blank in the middle. Okay? And if you look carefully, he's also got a human head that he's carrying with him. The reason I don't think these depict the same person is he's carrying his head. Now, this could be an easy story if that's where it ended, but if you look carefully, there's one more wrinkle. He may be carrying his head, but this figure is, is wearing the scalp of that figure. He's got his head plate on his scalp lock. So each of them appears to have taken the head of the other which means this isn't a linear narrative, it's a cyclical narrative. It's a supernatural narrative, and if we look for that kind of linearity or we assume we're seeing the same figure each time, we're gonna get in a world of trouble and not understand the complexity of the story and why and how it has meaning. It becomes even more complicated when we get between media. So if we go from Grepise Copper to Engraved Shell, these things become even harder to argue. So please notice that both of these figures have a large beaded necklace and a columella. They have a, a, a bellows-shaped apron, which is believed to represent a scalp lock, with the bare patch in the middle where there ought to be something, but there isn't because the figure whose head they carry doesn't have one. And of course, he has this wonderful ceremonial mace in his hand here. Do these represent the same figure? I don't know. They come from hundreds and hundreds of miles apart. I'm sure they reference some figure that has a lot in common, but I'm not convinced they represent exactly the same character who's understood in exactly the same way for doing exactly the same deeds. This is important because the most important thing we can learn from studying iconography and from studying how ancient objects mean is allowing the past to surprise us and confound our expectations. Living Native American societies have a very rich iconographic tradition that's celebrated in the exhibition. And it's important that you see it and you enjoy it and you understand it. But the worlds of the past were every bit as complex as the worlds of the present. And their ability to surprise us is only allowed if we recognize their complexity and recognize that the stories that survive today are not necessarily all of the stories that energized these works a thousand years ago. And with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Thank you. I will ask that instead of just shouting out questions, there are two people.
That was embarrassing. Yeah. I was about to say, instead of just shouting out questions, please wait for someone to hand you the microphone. And then I walked away from the microphone. <laughs> please feel free to raise your hand and we will come around with the microphone. I am um, from, from Southern Illinois and have been to what we call Cahokia Mounds and it was always told that the culture kind of mysteriously disappeared and was wondering what your thoughts were about that disappearance. The culture didn't disappear but there's plenty mysterious about it nonetheless. So Cahokia has a fluorescence that's very early. It takes off about 1050 AD, and by 1250, it's in decline. This is a remarkable site. Do all of you know Cahokia? Would you show your hands if you know Cahokia? Okay, for those of you who don't, Cahokia is this big bang of Mississippian development. It shows up very early. It's very large. It has more than 120 mounds at the site. The largest mound at the site, called Monk's Mound, or Mound 38, is more than 1,000 feet long and 100 feet high, and it's larger in basal area than the Great Pyramid in Egypt. So it's a remarkable site. By 1250, it's going into decline, and it seems to be largely abandoned by the time many of the other Mississippian mound sites take off. But at the same time, other Mississippian mound sites are taking off all across the southeast. So you have this initial development, and then you see things happening all over the place. And there seem to be all kinds of contact between these sites and Cahokia. And as a result, we have groups all over the southeast who feel like they have their origins at Cahokia, and yet they're from linguistic groups that are every bit as different as, say, French and Chinese. Now, it's possible that's because Cahokia was this amalgamation of ethnically different groups, and it's possible because what we're really seeing are the echoes of influence and the impact of different groups over time that are coming together and splitting apart. And we can't underestimate that. The Natchez that I started with, the Natchez don't survive into the historic period. They're destroyed as a tribe, and there is nothing left of the Natchez as a tribe. There are descendants of the Natchez, and they become amalgamated into other groups over time. And if we imagine the social dynamics of prehistory, I'm sure there were groups who developed, fragmented, were taken over, destroyed, died through disease, whatever, and then reformed into something else. So there's no disappearance of Mississippian society, but none of us have been able to adequately explain why Cahokia takes off, becomes so big, bigger than anything in later periods, and then disappears so quickly. And actually, that's not fair. Many of us have explained it. The rest of us don't believe them. <laughs> yes? I had a, well, um, a question about the shell type. Um, have they been sourced? Are they the same type of shell for the different gorgets? As far as we know, they're all one of a, a set of very closely related conch shell species from the Gulf of Mexico. This same species can be found on the Atlantic coast, and there's been a little bit of work by Cheryl Clausen at Appalachian State University to try to source the shells, but it's no, notoriously diff difficult to source marine shells because many of the same effects that would lead to chemical differences in shell, you're dealing with the same currents. So it's, it's hard to say. The question is wonderful for a different reason, though, actually two reasons. One is that at Spyro in particular, Michelle was kind enough to mention the obsidian work that was done in the early 2000s that showed that there was at least some Mesoamerican material coming to Spyro. At about that same time, Laura Kozich, who's in Illinois now, did work on a different kind of shell, the small shell beads that are found at Spyro. One burial, I think it was burial 145, had something like 14,000 olivella beads. And they were believed to be a particular kind of olivella that's native to the Gulf of Mexico. Her work showed they're actually all from the Gulf of California, which means it does implicate some kind of Mesoamerican contact. And that's not one scraper, that's 14,000 beads. Granted, that could be one shell cloak, shell bead cloak, but it's still a much more hefty contribution and that's just based on the taxonomy of the shells. The other thing that has not been done, but in theory could be done, 
Archaeologically, shells are just the neatest things. Shells by their nature, even, even bivalve shells, bivalve mollusks that you find in the rivers throughout this region, they've got a very fascinating biology because the, the layer inside the bivalve mollusk, the periostracum that lays down the nacreous, lays down the shell, it does that in increments every 14 days. And because it's pulling from the environment, as it does that, it's fractionating different isotopes that tell you what the environment was like every 14 days while it's alive. And number one, that tells you what the environment was like on a 14-day cycle. But number two, it works just like tree rings. So if you look at in enough detail, you can actually stack them up and see a sequence over time by the width of the rings. So there are all these cool things you could do with shell. Unfortunately, you have to saw them in half and look at them under a microscope, and we're not likely to do that with engraved shell cuffs. But we can do it with mollusk shell that's from more pedestrian deposits. So, sorry, I was starting to geek. <laughs> I think there was another question in the, the center. Yes. Why were the spiders always backwards? Why were the spiders always backwards? The spiders? The spiders. You mean like upside down? I, I'm not sure, but what I think is going on is when the spiders are right side up, they're still climbing up the celestial vault, so they haven't gotten sacred fire yet. They're shown most commonly upside down with their head down, because when they're coming down, they have the cross in circle representing sacred fire on their back. So people tend to depict them having brought sacred fire instead of showing them at the beginning of that journey. At the beginning of that journey, they're really just a spider. But at the end of the journey, they're the Promethean element, the thing that brings sacred fire to earth. So they become really important from a cultural standpoint. That's what I think is happening. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Have there been any examples of stories from Native Americans uh, with woodpeckers and culture and being warriors or some sort of creation of the warrior from woodpeckers or anything like that? Oh, yes. Yes, there are a whole series of them. The problem is there isn't one that I can say all Southeastern groups share. So, and, and interestingly, I can't find, I'm not aware of any. And again, I'm not either a folklorist or a specialist in Native American ethnography but I'm not aware of any that I can point to that it's unambiguous an ivory-billed woodpecker. So for example, there are plenty of stories that explain why red-crested or red-headed woodpeckers have red heads. And there's also a series of associations between woodpeckers and cedar. So it's not just the fact you have a cedar handle on a, a copper-bitted woodpecker ax, it's woodpeckers and cedar have a very close association because cedar is a tree that's believed to be alive and gives breath. The scent of cedar is supposed to be a living thing or represented as a living thing. And woodpeckers are related to that in a variety of ways in some stories because they release that breath by chipping at the tree. And in some cases, the breath is what gives them the characteristics they have. But there isn't a single story that seems to unite the Southeast the way, for example, sacred fire as a motif does. So there are examples. And they're sort of like the European goldfinch in the, the Raphael I showed you, where there's an explanation for why they have this, this particular marking. But one of the things that makes them fun is there are so many different ones. So if, if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to answer the question you didn't ask because it's what I'm interested in. <laughs> and that's, are there any more ivory-billed woodpeckers? Are they extinct? So in... in in 2004, a gentleman was kayaking down Bayou de Vue in Arkansas. This is an experienced naturalist. And he saw a big bird flying toward him down the bayou. This is an old wood bayou, so it's got huge trees, and there's just this narrow corridor where the bayou cuts through. He sees this bird flying toward him, and when it sees him, it flares away. So it turns and, and turns aside. And he's going through his field list, and he can't make it come out to anything because nothing works. That, it's not that, it's not that, it's not that. Well, it can't be that, it's not that, it's not that. It can't be, 
It can't be anything except that. And then he, he managed to see it again. And in 2005, I was at a, a symposium on large woodpeckers, just dealing with the ecology of large woodpeckers. I'm not a biologist, but I was there because since I study the iconography of those things, I was able to talk about the distribution of iconography of woodpeckers. They were hoping that might give them an idea of, of ancient ranges. And because I'm basically an enthusiast, I'm listening to him say this, and I'm just getting goggle-eyed. And I'm thinking, I, I, I can't look like this because I'm going to look like an idiot in front of all these professional biologists who deal with this stuff every day. So finally, I look down the row, and everybody down the row is crying. Now, we don't know whether or not there are ivory bills out there. There is some acoustic work that's been done in northern Florida that suggests that the distinctive Kent call of ivory bills may be being heard, but it's not clear. All of those things do fit the historic range of ivory bills. There are also a couple of other elements. Archaeologically, we find ivory bills in archaeological sites, but we only find two elements. We find the skull with the beak, and we find this, well, it's not actually this part. If you imagine what looks like this part on us, this is the part you find. Because it's what makes these woodpeckers so cool. The top, the, none of these are ivory bill or, or pileated woodpeckers. These are what they look like elsewhere. So ivory bills are Campophilus principalis, pileated woodpeckers are Dryocopus pileatus. Campophilid woodpeckers are found throughout the Americas and parts of the old world. So are dryocopid woodpeckers like pileated. Everywhere they're found, they're sympatric and cryptic, which means they feed in similar areas and they do similar things, and they're easy to confuse. They're cryptic. But they're not genetically closely related. But you find this in one area after another. But they've got one thing that's different between them in particular that I find fascinating. This is a dryocopid woodpecker, like a pileated woodpecker. This is actually a lineated woodpecker from Guatemala and Central America. And they do what all other woodpeckers do. They've got a zygodactyl talon, so we've got a big X-shaped talon. And they grab onto the tree, and then they use their tail feathers as a support to brace themselves so they can hammer on the tree. Campophilid woodpeckers, like ivory bills, are bigger than that. So they do more than that. Besides grabbing onto the tree and besides bracing with the tail, all of this part of their leg is braced up against the tree. It's a separate bone called a tarsometatarsal. It represents the fusion of a couple of different elements. The two elements we find on archaeological sites are the skull and the tarsometatarsal, which is the distinguishing element between an ivory bill and a pileated woodpecker. Very few archaeologists know that, but Mississippians apparently did because that's the thing that ends up being found in archaeological sites. This is a, a CT x-ray scan of an a ivory billed woodpecker from a museum collection. And this is the element we're talking about. So, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't help that. Thank you so much to Dr. Alex Barker for such an interesting and insightful talk. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Spirit Lodge Mississippian Art from Spyro is on view at the DMA till August 7th, so please be sure to come back and visit us. I would also like to inform you of two upcoming talks. Our annual Bertel Lecture will be held on April 28th and will feature art historian Dr. Marnie Kessler, who will dig into the DMA's Edward Manet's Brioche with Pears, and depictions of food in 19th century French paintings. <clears throat> the talk is followed by a reception featuring small bites inspired by European, European paintings in the DMA's collection. On April 30th, join the curators of the DMA's Slip Zone, a new look at post-war abstraction in the Americas and East Asia. Dr. Catherine Ann Bradbeck and Dr. Vivian Lee will be joined by Danielle Burns Wilson Curator and Art Director at the Project Row Houses, Dr. Adele Nelson, Assistant Professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and Art Historian and Curator Ray Gotomi. <laughs>
More information on the talks can be found on dma.org. Thank you again to Dr. Alex Barker, and thank you all for joining us tonight.